Microplastics 101, today's topic. And first things, I, I typically poll the audience for what is the definition of microplastics, and I get all sorts of different answers, usually like really small plastics, which is correct. But technically speaking, when we talk about microplastics, it's anything five millimeters in size or smaller to the point where it's no longer visible. Um, for those of us that might not be very familiar with the millimeter world, uh, that's about the size of a pencil eraser. So that's five millimeters. So, you know, that's a decent size, but anything that size or smaller, we refer to, and if it's plastic, is microplastics. Now, the plastic products that we see and use every day start off like this. And these are called nurdles. That's kind of your fun word for the day. Nurdles. And so these are the raw resin pellets that we use. Uh, they're shipped all over the world to plastics manufacturers, and then they're melted down and molded into the various plastic products that we use. So you can see here just some examples. These were actually found on a beach uh, up in North Florida, but uh, they're different colors. So, you know, depending, we have lots of different colored plastic products that we use. So melted down and molded into plastic products we see. Sometimes you can find plastics like this. Um, in the raw resin form called nurdles. If they aren't melted down and molded, sometimes they can be used as stuffing and things like pillows, and in this case, Beanie Babies. So this could be another fun thing to do at home with the kiddos, especially right now. Uh, you can dissect a Beanie Baby and see how many nurdles are inside. So this is one that was from a kid's meal, and there was 371 nurdles in this little tiny Beanie Baby. So when it comes to plastics, this, um, we can point to something and say, okay, it's, this is plastic, but there's many different types of plastic, and I'm not going to get into all the details. I just kind of want to make one point here is that when we think about plastics entering the environment, and especially our water bodies, there's different densities of plastic. And so you can see here, these are some of the more common plastics, so polypropylene, polystyrene, Foam beads, we can just ignore the PS part. Uh, PVC, we're most familiar with as pipe and piping. Uh, polyethylene, which we'll talk about later, and then nylon. And you can see uh, down here at the bottom of your screen, these are these different types of plastic in vials of tap water. And so you can see some are more buoyant and will float. And others, like the polystyrene and the nylon, are more dense and will sink. So when we're looking at this in terms of when it gets out into the ocean environment and just the struggles and challenges with microplastics is these different densities uh, and where we're finding microplastics in the environment. So things like bottle caps and plastic bags and obviously any type of like foamy material will be more buoyant and float. There's some that kind of find themselves in the middle will be buoyant in the middle of the water column and then heavier objects like our synthetic clothing and other textiles um, as well as drink containers will often be more dense and sink to the bottom. Now, in terms of, so there's two broad categories of microplastics. There's primary microplastics and secondary microplastics. In the primary world, we have the nurdles, which I mentioned before, those raw resin pellets that we make all of our plastic products from. But there's also something called microbeads, and that's often the term we get when plastics are put into our personal care products. So I'll talk a little bit more about this. We, every September, do a Microplastic Awareness Month, and this was a few, from a few years ago. Uh, we made different memes just to draw people's attention to this concept of plastics being in our personal care products. And so this was a deodorant I just had, like, I don't know, lying around in my office or something, and it turned out it did have plastic in it. Obviously the container itself is plastic, but you can look on the ingredients list and it'll tell you that it also contains plastic. So I encourage you guys after this webinar, go check out your deodorant and see if it contains plastic and I'll tell you how in a minute. So this was going to be another uh, poll question, just asking you uh, which word you should look for on the ingredients list on your personal care products. So.
you want to do a word search, another fun activity for the kiddos at home or adults too. <laughs> so you can find any of your personal care products. And just like when we go shopping at the grocery store and buy food, we look at the ingredients list. Well, our personal care products also have an ingredients list. So you can check that out and you want to do a word search for the term polyethylene. And I know that's small on your screen. I have some other zoomed in ones here. So polyethylene is the word that you want to look for. It's one form of plastic and the one that is most often put in personal care products. So it tells you right there on your products. If so, in the case of toothpaste, for example, we often will buy it in a container. We take that home, we open it up, we discard the container, and then we're left with a tube of toothpaste. And there's a limited ingredients list on that. The full ingredients list is on the box. So if you're unsure and you want to do a search, you can use the household products database, which I actually just went to go to, to share the link with you guys. Um, and it looks like they're currently in the process of updating. I couldn't, I, there was a server error when I uh, did it. So I will be pushing you guys out the link or sending it in a follow-up email afterwards. Um, it looks like they've archived the old database and they're currently do, coming out with a new one. But through this database, previously, I'll just show you what uh, you could do. You can type in, in this quick search box, the term polyethylene. So you type it in, it'll say, is this the word that you want? And you say yes. And then it gives you a list of products, all the products in the database that have polyethylene in them. It starts off with things like plastic bags, which obviously we know are made of plastic. But then you can see here on your screen, uh, there's all sorts of different products. So there's a bunch of different types of makeup, mascara, uh, toothpaste, we talked about deodorant already. What else is on here? Some lotions, foot cream, anyone? <laughs> Anti-aging lotion, some sunscreen. So you can see there's many different types of personal care products that can, can contain microbeads. And so, the word again you're looking for is polyethylene. So I just did a quick search in Google, took a screenshot just to show you guys what exactly is polyethylene. And you can see here a tough, light, flexible synthetic resin made by polymerizing ethylene, like whatever that all means, chiefly used for plastic bags, food containers, and other packaging. So why are they putting poly polyethylene in our personal care products? The truth is we really don't know the official answer. The assumptions in the scientific community are that it can be used as filler to help so they, uh, manufacturers can use less of the actual product. It can also be used as uh, kind of making the product look more appealing to the consumer. You can make microbeads look pretty and purple. So when you're looking for that exfoliating face wash, that is a draw to consumers that wouldn't think that, that, it, that it is plastic that is in the product. So, not to freak you out, because there's good news. So this got win with all the um, political parties throughout the whole world, and action was taken very, very quickly on this act that was passed by President Obama in December of 2015. So it's the Microbead Free Waters Act of 2015. It was passed very, very quickly because it obviously made no sense why we were putting plastic in our personal care products. Now, the um, kind of caveat to this, so this only applies to rinse off cosmetics that are used for cleansing and exfoliating purposes. So there are like any legislation loopholes in the act, but the face wash that I had before that I showed you has polyethylene in it. I was like, oh, the act, so the act went into place in 2017. Uh, you could no longer, manufacturers could no longer put it polyethylene in their products. And by 2018 summer, they had to, they could no longer be sold on store shelves. So there's kind of a phasing out process. And so I went and purchased the same face wash and it said right on there, does not contain plastic microbeads. Yay. <laughs> so super cool. I was super excited. We have a national group of us that are working on uh, personal care products and pharmaceuticals. And so I shared this with them. And then, of course, one of the researchers was like, well, 
technically, and there was another ingredient that was actually already in there before, that's another form of plastic. So again, another loophole in the act. But that being said, this just happened to be the one that I picked. Um, but most companies are completely eliminating the polyethylene from their products and aren't trying to sneak other things in. So that is the good news. So where else do microplastics come from? Okay, this part can kind of get depressing. Not that we need to be any more depressed than we already are, but <laughs> number one source uh, for what, what we would call secondary microplastics, so they start off in a larger form and break down over time, is wear and tear on tires, sandblasting from the boat industry. So historically back in, I don't know how long ago, many years ago, we actually used to use sand for sandblasting. It's now tiny, tiny pieces of plastic that are used for that process. Construction is a huge contributor. Synthetic paint, so most paints are composed of synthetic material that, you know, when it chips and uh, breaks apart over time, can be a source of microplastics. There was a huge uh, kind of uproar, at least for the teen community, when there was a big thing in the news about litter being a source of microplastics. And so, Everyone kind of freaked out about that, but most glitter is plastic. So sorry to burst your bubble on that one. And then this, so I grew up in Jupiter, Florida on the Southeast coast. And one time I just went for a walk on the beach when I was home and just started taking pictures of all the plastic products that I saw washed up on shore. Anyone know what this is? Let's see, let's make it fun and interactive. I'm gonna open up the chat again real quick. Okay, so you guys can chat with me. I'll get your responses or here, you know what? Let's do it to everybody so everyone can see. What do you guys think this is? It's a little bit easier to tell when you're just right here on the computer. <laughs> yes, Jacob got it right away. Usually when we're sitting further back, uh, and I do this presentation, it takes a long time for anybody to figure out. But yeah, it's a soccer trophy. So somebody either didn't like their trophy, they got second place instead of first, but it ended up washed up on shore. And I'm sure it was covered with synthetic paint of some form prior to what we see here on the screen. So good job. Okay. Oops. So again, tons of different plastic products just scattered along the beach. And this poll question that I was going to post was just asking you for the term that we use when those plastic products break down over time and eventually reach that size, you guys remember, five millimeters or smaller. And so we refer to those as secondary microplastics because they didn't start off that small. So this is an example of some secondary microplastics found. Uh, during a beach sample, just very, very tiny chunks of plastic. Okay, there's more. <laughs> Stay with me. So, in terms of secondary microplastics, again, unfortunately, here in Florida, this is very relevant to us. So, it's been pretty warm. A lot of us might be getting out of our nice, quick, dry clothing that we love or we love our soft microfiber sheets and in the winter we grab our nice cozy fleece jackets but unfortunately these are made of plastic um, and so you can look right on the tag it tells you what material makes up your clothing or your sheets or whatever textiles that you have and so you can see here this one was hundred percent polyester and so the issue here is hopefully we all do laundry. I'm sure a lot of us are doing more laundry now than we were maybe a few weeks ago. Uh, so we do laundry, we put them in there, they get all agitated. Those fibers can get loose and shed in the washing machine. And so where does that water, so it fills up, closer in there, who knows where that water goes? I'm gonna open up the chat again since my poles aren't working. It's 
So if you know the answer for where your water goes, I'll let, I'll let a few of you chime in. Okay, we've got a bunch of different answers. The ocean, groundwater, back into the water supply, sewer, wastewater treatment plant, drinking water. Yeah, so lots of different answers. And technically, you're all right, but I'll show you guys kind of the, the formal flow in which everything goes. So when we wash our clothes, that water, once it drains, gets sent to, an, well, not necessarily nearby, but a wastewater treatment plant somewhere, probably within your county. And from there, there's a whole process that the water goes through that I'm not going to get into now. But basically, they, go, they separate the solids from the liquids, and we won't get into details there either. But once the water is completely treated, then it will be dumped into a local body of water. So for our case in Pinellas County, a lot of it goes to South Cross Bayou, and that outflow goes into Joe's Creek, which is eventually, eventually all connected to Tampa Bay and then the Gulf. So it eventually makes its way to a body of water. Now there's been lots of studies looking at wastewater treatment plants because lots of water is going there and therefore lots of microplastics are going there. Now they are not designed to remove microplastics. There's no way that wastewater treatment plants could filter out these microscopic plastics with the amount of water that they're receiving. So what they've found just in studying the process that they currently go through, that water goes through at a treatment plant, is that the majority are removed in the sludge. Just think solids. <laughs> um, and so in our case in Pinellas County, those solids are then converted and sold as fertilizer. And so it's ultimately ending up back out in the environment in one way or the other. Um, so it's either in the sludge or it's not getting completely removed and then is ending up back into the water. So this was discovered, so the term microplastics wasn't even coined until 2004. So in the scientific world, this is still relatively new, but we are starting to find and many researchers throughout the country are doing water samples and finding these fibers shed from our clothing. And so this is a sample of a red fiber from a sample that I took. I took a picture through my through the microscope with my phone. And so that is one of many things that we're looking for under the microscope. Now there's been several different studies as well to see how many fibers are shed from different articles of clothing. Fleece jackets are the most studied object, if you want to call it that, because um, A, lots of people have them, but B, we know that they are, the fibers of fleece are easily shed. And so this was one study showed that as many as over 100,000 fibers were shed um, per garment, which is a lot. So, you know, that's your excuse. You don't have to wash your fleece. <laughs> So why should we care? Plastics are very, very prevalent. They didn't really become uh, widely used until after World War II. And then you can see here the curve is just for world plastic production is just continuing to grow and is expected to continue to grow. It's a very, you know, it doesn't break. That's great, but it also doesn't break down, which is a problem. <laughs> and so there was a really wide widely um, published study on a researcher that was trying to quantify how much plastic is there in the ocean. And basically through her research and what she was able to come up with just for, so it's something that we can mentally grasp. So the medium number was about 8 million metric tons, which again, okay, it sounds like a lot, but what does that mean? So she put it in these terms, which is five grocery bags full of trash, so if you were to take a regular grocery bag, fill it full of trash, stack, you know, five tall for every foot of shoreline for the 192 countries that were in the study, which is basically every country in the world. So a lot of plastic. Uh, there was estimates also done on the microbeads. This was before the act went into place, but they equated it to, so this is daily, enough to cover 300 tennis courts 
And so we're talking, these are very, very microscopic beads. Um, so not encouraging stuff, but I'm gonna end on a positive note, an encouraging note. So, um, so there is other research that's being done by what we would call like citizen scientists. So every year there's an international coastal cleanup effort. You might've heard of it, or maybe many of you have participated in it. And every year they always list the top 10 items that were collected. In 2017, that was the first year that all of top 10 items were plastic. And so you can see what they were on the right. Cigarette butts are always number one. And then these others are usually in there in some form or the others. They all switch places every now and then. But and you can see straws. There was a lot of hype about straws a few months ago. So we, we can, the good news is these are things that we can control. So since microplastics entered the scientific world, there's been lots of studies looking at where they are and what concentrations are they. And so the first study that came out, there was one based in China looking at table salt. And then there's been several studies looking at salt since then. They found microplastics in beer, um, bottled water, tap water, uh, in microscopic organisms. So we know that the plastics are there. Um, they're in the air. That if you've ever you know, done laundry and you shake it out, and you, if the light's right, you can see the filaments in the air. They're not necessarily all plastic, but um, so that is a concern when researchers are doing studies, they tend to have hard time limiting contamination because there's lots of stuff just falling from the air. But the concern is when these microplastics enter the ocean. So there's toxins in the ocean from activities that we did way back when, you know, before the Clean Water Act went into place, we were dumping all sorts of things in the water. And those things are still there. Not all of them, but many of them. And what we're finding is that when the plastics are in the water and these toxins are in the water, there's this attraction to one another. And so toxins tend to be more highly concentrated on plastic particles than they are on organic material. And then organisms are ingesting the plastics either intentionally or unintentionally. So there's filter feeders that are just sucking in whatever's in the water and they don't have control over what they're taking in. Um, but others, they might mistake the plastic, especially things like nurdles that look like fish eggs. So there's other organisms that are consuming plastics, misidentifying it for something else. So plastics can biodegrade, they can degrade over time, but it takes a really, really, really long time. And that's not necessarily something that we can wait and rely on for a solution. So the challenges when it comes to recovery of microplastics is these are really, really small. There's a lot of ocean out there and other water bodies. It's not just limited to oceans. And as I mentioned before, they're distributed throughout the water column. So that makes it hard. We can't just go through and skim anything off the surface. And then the, the main concern is that, um, you know, how can we remove these microscopic plastics that are the same size as microscopic organisms? And, and the answer is basically we can't. And so we need to stop plastics at the source. So we'll skip that. It was just kind of a encouraging, what can we do? And it gives you all sorts of options. So I'm gonna just go through some things that we can do and think about. So we've heard about reduce, reuse, recycle forever, hopefully. <laughs> so refuse is really the big one when it comes to plastics. We can, there's many times that we can bring our own products or we can just simply do without. So straws are a good example of that. Whenever I would go to a restaurant, I would say, I'd like water, no straw, please. So just refusing it to begin with. Checking the labels on your personal care products. Oops, sorry about that. So you can look on that ingredients list and, you know, if you have the products at home, you can discard them. Um, but if you're going out to purchase new products, just make sure you check and aren't purchasing products that contain the plastic in them. Participating in beach cleanups is a great way, you know, preventing the plastics, get them while they're big and visible before they break down into tiny microplastics. 
leading by example, a great way, again, encourage your friends and neighbors and family. So both serving the same purpose with water bottles here. This would be one time use and done, and this you can use forever. At the office, same thing applies, you know, don't be that office with the styrofoam cups, have your own and just take that extra time to wash and reuse your cups. So when you're out and about, we already kind of referred to the straws. This was again one of those memes we did for the Microplastic Awareness Month in September. So the ocean doesn't need any more, more straws, do you? And again, when you go shopping, bringing your own bags is an easy way to help reduce your contribution to use of one-use plastics. And, oops. and then just asking and speaking up. So the, um, these are two examples that I did. The one on the left is an organization I volunteer for and they give out a lot of shirts and they were a, a blend of synthetic material and cotton. And I just said, hey, you know, I do this thing on microplastics. Any chance we could do 100% cotton? And so they did, and that was great. And same with work. I was always presenting in what I thought was my 100% cotton shirt whenever I did my microplastics program. And it turned out I did not own one shirt for work that was 100% cotton. And so I mentioned that to my boss and my boss's boss. And long story short, this is my, I'm wearing one now, and this is my success story. They now have 100% cotton shirts available for us. And I'm sorry, this, that was uh, tailored for uh, teachers. So there might be teachers tuning in, but I'm assuming most of them are doing their own virtual classes. So we do have a pledge. We're doing this throughout the whole state. We've been doing it since 2015. We have thousands of people that have taken different pledges of ways that they can reduce their contribution to microplastics. So I will, again, when I'm done with the presentation, I'll push out that pledge. And that's something you guys can do after the webinar as a family or as an individual. I saw mixed results when I asked you guys that question. So it might give you some other ideas, things you can do as well. So I'll show you to the Plastic Aware Dot org website, but this is a pretty easy URL to remember, so it'll redirect you, but this is the uh, easy one, plasticaware.org, and you can go there, and there's pretty much anything you could want to know about microplastics is there, tons of resources for you, and even tools for you to help teach others about microplastics. They also have a Facebook group, so you can go search for Microplastic Awareness Project. This is part of that effort. It's twofold. There's outreach, which is what I'm doing now, and then there's a citizen science effort to collect water samples and look for microplastics. So you can scope that out on Facebook, and Dr. Maya McGuire that spearheads this effort posts stuff regularly on new research and just other things that she's been working on as it relates to microplastics. Bye, everybody.